Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Hello, Swepsonville United Methodist Church. Happy Easter season on this first or second Sunday of Easter, first Sunday after our, our the beginning of Easter. Um, I want to say this is going to be my, my last Sunday here working with Swepsonville, and I might not have met you. You might have just tuned in on these videos, and so I have just wanted to say that um, I'm happy to have, have shared my, my, um, my prayers and my thoughts and my, the ways that I think God is speaking in Scripture. And uh, for those who are watching that I've met, I've, it's been such a joy to be able to uh, know you and to be here at Swepsonville Church. So thank you all for being part of my journey um, as I go through Duke and as I prepare for pastoral ministry. Today our scripture passage comes from, our first scripture passage comes from the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 20, and we're going to start at verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. But Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of many, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But, those, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Our second scripture passage comes from... 1 Peter, starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for our salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you've had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, that your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What does it look like to believe in Jesus? 
Here again in the Gospel of John, we see Thomas. Now, this story is probably the most famous Thomas encounters, and you've probably heard him referred to as Doubting Thomas. But I want to say that I think his struggles as a disciple go a little deeper than just doubt. A couple weeks, weeks ago, we looked at John 11 and saw how Thomas, even after Jesus explained that they were going to raise Lazarus from the dead, introduced death into the conversation. Jesus says, let us go and raise our brother Lazarus. And Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with him. He will follow Jesus, but he doesn't express faith or hope in Jesus's resurrection power. Thomas does not believe Jesus. The second time we see Thomas is in John 14. Jesus is speaking to his disciples at his last meal with them, and Thomas asks, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? This seems innocent enough, but this question comes right after Jesus spent five verses answering Peter's question, Lord, where are you going? Jesus explains explicitly that he is going to the Father's house. But Thomas inserts confusion and disbelief. Thomas does not believe Jesus. And here we come to Thomas again. The other of the 12 disciples have encountered Jesus miraculously as he appears in a locked room. Upon telling him, we have seen the Lord, Thomas does not believe. Instead, he demands evidence. He wants to see the wounds of Christ on a living body before he will believe in the resurrection. Again, we see that Thomas does not believe. What's interesting is that Thomas's lack of belief doesn't diminish his commitment to Jesus. One commentator even notes that Thomas seems to exhibit a Spartan-like courage as a disciple. He's willing to go all the way, even to death, but he lacks faith, even if he has courage. Ironically, it is this courage which I believe enables him to finally exhibit profound faith. See, fortunately for Thomas, God's grace isn't dependent on Thomas's faith. While Thomas demands proof, Jesus offers presence. When he appears again to the disciples, he greets the room, but he immediately turns to Thomas to offer him his proof, to offer him himself. Though he had so much trouble believing for, believing before, Thomas sees Jesus. He believes and he goes on to see who Jesus really is. Thomas, the one who doubted and disbelieved Jesus throughout the gospel, now courageously utters, My Lord and my God. This is the most profound confession about Jesus' identity throughout all of John. No one else names Jesus as God. What we see in Thomas is a doubtful, disbelieving disciple who is nevertheless committed to staying with Jesus, committed to staying with the disciples. Yet God is still present with Thomas, even if he has his own struggles. If anything, Thomas' story expands our sense of discipleship. We don't need to hold on to an image of having to be the perfect Jesus follower. If Thomas tells us anything, it's that God doesn't abandon us as we struggle in our Christian journey. Church tradition tells us that St. Thomas would go on after this account encounter where he confesses, Jesus is my God, and he spreads the gospel all the way to India. That's a long way to go on foot from Jerusalem. Overcoming disbelief, Thomas's experience of Jesus as the resurrected one leads him to dramatically new depths of discipleship. 
We may also notice one of the interesting lines Jesus offers in this passage. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is more of our reality. Most Christians, I assume, have not had the experience of seeing Jesus standing before us and touching his wounds. Our first Peter passage today names us in another way. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Our lives as Christians are so often centered in not seeing. As Paul names in 2 Corinthians, we walk by faith, not by sight. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, talks about faith as the only condition for our justification. Justification is our experience of rebirth, our experience of our sins being forgiven, our experience of God overcoming the barrier of sin, which has kept us from relationship with God. All we need is faith. We don't need the evidence that Thomas demands, for as Wesley explains, faith is a divine evidence that leads us to recognize God's love for us. Faith's, faith helps us recognize that God has indeed raised Jesus from the dead. This first Peter passage goes on at length discussing the trials of this life, perhaps the doubt or disbelief like Thomas encounters, or perhaps more concrete experiences of oppression and suffering. Amidst these things, our faith is tested so that through faith we might live fully into the life Jesus offers us. What we need is faith. What we need is to trust the good news that God offers. Death is not the end. Jesus has conquered death and now invites us to share in his death and in his resurrection. But... Mm. wouldn't it be nice to just have Jesus show up in such an obvious and apparent way? I know that Jesus says, blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. But Thomas is still a disciple. Jesus still loves him. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just have a, a little easier faith journey and just be slightly less blessed? I think of the line from the Psalms, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. Well, maybe those who are more believing or more trusting or more faithful might have more prestigious jobs in the kingdom of God. But if it makes life easier, if it makes faith easier, wouldn't you love to just be Thomas and take the easy way out to faith? just having full sight? Maybe, maybe we could just be a doorkeeper. That'd be fine. I don't need to be an executive in, in uh, Heaven's, I don't know, strategic team. But we don't all have the same journey. Oftentimes, God calls us to do hard things, like believing without sight or stepping outside of our comfort zone. See, Thomas followed Jesus, this crazy teacher who said something ludicrous about resurrection, and he kept with him. That was Thomas's challenge. Well, the story of Thomas tells us, though, is that God is with us even before we have faith. This is what Wesley calls prevenient grace, the grace that acts in our lives before we know God or before we trust God. See, this First Peter passage sets a difficult task ahead of us. First Peter's address to Christians across ancient Asia Minor praises the way that they have kept the faith even in the midst of trials and adversity. They exhibit a powerful model of faith by loving Jesus, although they have not seen him. They believe in him and rejoice even without seeing him. What might it take for us to live into this model of faithfulness, 
even if we lack the sight of Thomas? How might we learn to proclaim, my Lord and my God? First of all, we must realize that faith is not just something we can muster up. No, faith is grounded in God's action first in our lives. First Peter tells us that Jesus gives us a new birth into a living hope. In John, Jesus comes to Thomas him and turns to him immediately. Jesus acts first in our journey of following him. In other words, faith is empowered by God. Secondly, in this passage, you may notice the familiar combo of faith, hope, and love. These are the three central virtues of the Christian life, the central practices of following Jesus. And they are gifts. But faith cannot be a standalone thing. In other parts of the New Testament, we see this combo used to call people to live more fully in discipleship. In 1 Corinthians 13, you may recall there is a buildup of these virtues. Faith and hope are important, but love is the greatest of these three. This is the message Paul offers to the Corinthians who struggle to live in community with each other. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul alters this order for the needs of the Thessalonians. He remembers the work of faith and the labor of love and the steadfastness of hope in Jesus. Faith and love help the Thessalonians step deeper into hope, even amidst marginalization in their community. But here, 1 Peter starts with hope. We, as followers of Jesus, have been given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope sustains love and faith. Both times Jesus both times Jesus appears to the disciples, he tells them, Peace be with you. Peace accompanies hope by giving us a vision of a world in which violence is not the order of the day. Peace and hope give us a foundation to love even in the face of uncertainty, a foundation to trust Jesus even when we can't see the future. The difficult part of faith is that we step forward into that which we do not know and cannot see. The hope we have in resurrection in this Easter season ought to ground us in the conviction that God is in the business of resurrection. But it's not easy. Faith entails stepping in a future we haven't seen before. It entails participating in God's work in bringing in the kingdom of God. A kingdom of resurrection, which we have only seen glimpses of or heard rumors about. It's tough work to step into the unknown, guided only by our conviction and the testimony of others. It's tough work to follow God when things aren't always crystal clear. It's tough work to trust in that which we cannot see. But this is our call, to step into Jesus' hope and Jesus' peace and know that Jesus is even now coming to us to invite us deeper as we follow him, though that might not mean clear and perfect sight. I want to close today with one of the best prayers I know that, that offers up this difficulty of holding faith, even as we are unable to really see and touch our risen Lord. This comes from Thomas Merton. Let us pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And, that I, and I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. 
I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Church, go in peace and hope, and know that on this faith journey, Jesus is walking with you, and Jesus is calling you. Peace.